Okay. Well, good morning and welcome to Kinmount Baptist Church and the wonderful community, the great community of Kinmount, Ontario, Canada. I think today is our last sermon in the 23rd chapter of Luke. One more chapter to go. These last few weeks have been around Calvary, you know. Last week we spoke on a topic that rarely is preached about, and that's the hours from 12 till 3 when Jesus is on the cross. They put him on the cross at 9 a.m. All the mocking, the blasphemy, all that stuff went on between 9 and 12. Jesus did give us, at least was recorded, three, three comments. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Remember that one? Yeah. Amazing. He's on the cross. He's been blasphemy, blasphemed, and he's asking his father to forgive them. All the mocking, all the abuse, suddenly, at noon, it stopped. Why? And we looked at it last week. Darkness filled all the land. Now, I don't know how far all the land was, but for sure, Jerusalem was filled. And the Greek word tells us it was pitch black. Pitch black. God the Father, He's always been present, but He shows up in a mighty way. And we went through all of what that meant last week. What else happened during that three hours after noon? From three, pardon me, from 12 till three. Well, right before three, Jesus speaks again, and we've taken a look at that. But before that, nobody's speaking. So it's pitch black. You can't see your hand in front of your face. And there's a great earthquake. And that great earthquake is so great that it split the rocks, it says. It's all happening. Later it says what? The grave started to open up. And some saints, some <laughs> I would have no, I wouldn't have loved to have been there. Come out of the graves. Now it says after Jesus was resurrected a couple of days later, they started going through the city of Jerusalem. Chaos in Jerusalem. That stalker movie. I tried to remember what the name of it was last week. What was it? What's that one where the zombies come out? And, okay. these, are, these are saved guys coming out of the graves. Amazing. And this all happens between 12 and 3. Amazing to me. And last week we took a look at the fact he died at 3 p.m. Calvary. And we sing about it. And we should have emotions when we sing about it, when we think about it, when we read about it. Today we're going to look at the burial of Jesus Christ. We looked at the cross last week, we looked at the crucifixion, and this darkness, the earthquakes, the rock splitting. What else happened when that darkness hit, when the earthquake hit? The rocks are splitting. Remember what else happened? The very same time, and we, we emphasized last week that this was the judgment of the Father. It wasn't judgment on the soldiers. It wasn't judgment on the leaders. It wasn't judgment on the people. It was the judgment on His Son. And that just breaks my heart to think about it, but I'm so happy because of my sin. He poured it all out on His Son. At the very same time that happened, what was going on in the temple? The priests were getting ready to do their Passover thing. It goes pitch black. They can't do it. They can't even see their hand, let alone the animals. They're all set to slaughter all these animals for, for Passover. And the lights come on, and what happens to the veil? The separation between God and man. These guys are out here getting ready to slaughter. The veil separates the holiness presence of God, and it splits from top to bottom, opening up the way. For you, for me, we have now direct access. We don't have to go through a priest. There's no need for priests anymore. There's no need for the temple anymore, for that matter. We have direct access to the Father, to His throne. 
because of what just happened at Calvary. So what about the burial? We don't, again, another one, you don't see too many, ser- or hear too many sermons on the burial. But it's amazing. When you dig into it, it's really, it's supernatural. The burial is supernatural. All four Gospels speak about it. I believe this, this burial was, was pre-planned. Anybody here have a pre-planned burial already? I do. My grand, my grand, my father-in-law. He found out how cheap they were at one time. He, he bought six of them. Six? Eight. Pardon me. He bought eight of them. One of them's for me. <laughs> I have a pre-planned burial. True story. But it's also not just pre-planned. This is prophesied. This is prophesied. And, it, and it, it, the, the burial of Jesus provides a glimpse. And it's just a glimpse. I'm just going to give you a glimpse today, folks, of some of the realities of life from God's perspective. Realities like the divine purpose of history. The divine purpose of history. What was the purpose of history? The sovereignty of God in all things. And we've spoken many times about the sovereignty of God and the responsibility of man and how they intermingle throughout life. God is sovereign, folks, in everything. In everything. The authenticity of Scripture. It's authentic. And not only does it contain God's Word, you know what I'm going to say. It is God's Word. Do you believe it? I hope so. The truth of the claims of Christ. Jesus makes a lot of claims. And every claim He makes is true. It's true. So if you have any questions on these things I'm talking about right now, pay attention to the burial. I think the burial can remove some of the questions that you may have. So I want to take a brief look at that, a very brief look at this, folks, today. How does God move in history? How does He move in history? Well, He moves directly sometimes. We call them miracles. Miracles. He also moves through what I call His providence. The providence of God. Those are the two ways he shows himself. The providence of God a lot more than the miracles. Miracles happen. I had some fun this last couple of weeks. Of course, I prepared this many weeks ago, but I I decided to take some time and go through the Old Testament very quickly, very quickly, to see if I could remember how many miracles I could remember in the Old Testament. But in the grand scheme of things, there's not a lot of miracles in the Old Testament. I think I counted over 60, but there was more than that. I stopped. I stopped. The Red Sea, the parting of the Red Sea. It's a, it's a miracle. What's a miracle, Bruce? Well, a miracle is the interruption, the interruption of natural law. That's what it is. That's what it is. Remember Elijah and the, and the, the widow at Zarephath? Elijah meets her out in the field. She's gaining a little bit of green. He says, I need some food. I need them. I'm thirsty. Give me, a, give me some bread. She says, I just got a little jar. I just got a little jar left of, of, of olive oil, and I got a little jar of flour, and I'm going to make a cake, and, and my son and they are going to die. The famine was through the land. People were dying like crazy. Elijah said, no, no, no. You feed me. Feed me. And the Bible tells us God provided for her until the heavy rains came. That's a miracle. That's a miracle. And, of course, the plagues of Egypt and Daniel, the, his three buddies, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they go into their thrown into the fire. The thing was so hot, the guys that threw them in died. And they're walking around in the fire. They come out of the fire. Not only are they alive, there's no smell on them. Miracle? You gotcha. You betcha. Miracle. What else in Daniel? Oh, Belshazzar. Remember Belshazzar? Handwriting on the wall? Natural law didn't do that. God did that. And it goes on and on and on. I, uh, I took a look at Samson. Remember Samson? Anybody remember Samson the judge? He was a character. He sure chased the woman, didn't he? Samson would kill his enemies. 
And one day he took a jawbone. I hope you know this story. It's a great story. And he didn't kill three of his enemies. He didn't kill 30 of his enemies. He didn't even kill 300 of his enemies that day. He killed 3,000 of his enemies that day with the jawbone of a donkey. Now, in my book, that's a miracle. That's a miracle. But as I said earlier, the grand scheme of things, there weren't a lot of miracles in the Old Testament. And then we get to the New Testament. And Jesus arrives on the scene. And we've been studying those three years of ministry. I think it's almost four years of, of just that section. From the beginning to the end of his ministry. The three plus years. Miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle. John says, I can't put them all in. There's so many of them. The people came. Jesus was a rock star. People came to see Jesus. They, by the thousands they came to see Jesus. He was a great teacher. Some would come for that. He was a great preacher. Some would come for that. But for the most part, they came to see his miracles, either to be in them themselves or watching somebody else. It wasn't always healing. 5,000 fed, 10,000 fed. You know these stories. Why? Why were there so many miracles with Jesus? Well, I think it's very simple. Jesus had to authenticate the fact that he was the Messiah. And only Messiah could do this stuff. And Jesus leaves the scene. The apostles can now perform miracles. But if you watch them, as the, as the apostles start to go down, and they die off eventually, obviously, ten of them were martyred, we know for sure, the miracles start to go down. And even the apostles didn't get to do it every time they wanted to do it. Paul's a good example of it. Miracles? Absolutely. After the apostles, have there been miracles? Yes. Yes. But very, very rare. When natural law is interrupted. That's number one. Number two. God moves through providence. You've heard of the providence of God. This is not rare. Miracles now are rare. I mean, we've seen, we've seen miracles. Let me back up just a minute. We're talking about Cuba this morning. Do you remember little Bismar? Do you remember little Bismar and the pictures we got and the crying out, could you please pray for little four, four years old, I think he was at the time? And he had all these tumors. He had cancer. He had all these lesions all over his body. And the hospital says... We got nothing for him. Don't bother sending him in. Just let him stay home and die. And so we started praying. Every week here, we were praying. Our, we were praying at home. They were praying down there. And by golly, we get a phone call and said, He's cured. He's cured. Spots are gone. Lesions are gone. Tumors are gone. And our gang went down this last couple of weeks. Guess who they saw? Little Bismarck. Don't tell me there's no miracles today. There's miracles today. But they're very rare, folks. Very rare. What about providence? God doesn't interrupt His natural law in His providence. It's not like miracles. I believe providence itself is a miracle if you follow through on it. Because what happens is as God weaves together the behaviors of men the behaviors of demons, the personalities of all individuals with precision to, f to do what? To fulfill exactly His will. I hope I didn't complicate that to you. His will must be done. He weaves it all together using all these different things to do just that. And it's constant. It's all the time. It's all the time. Well, what about to this redemptive history that you've talked about, Bruce? Well, it's interesting. We've talked about the plan that was made before the foundation of the earth, right? We've talked about that quite a bit. Well, what's going to happen is when the end comes to this history, it's going to look exactly like that plan back here. Exactly. What a God we serve. I think one of the best examples is in this passage that we're going to read now. The burial of Jesus Christ. 
Chapter 23, folks, verse, we'll start at verse 49. And all his acquaintances and the women who accompanied him from Galilee were standing at a distance seeing these things, all these things that we've seen these last few weeks. And a man named Joseph, who was a member of the council, a good and righteous man, he had not consented to their plan and action, a man from Arimathea, a city of the Jews who was waiting for the kingdom of God. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. And he took it down, and he wrapped it in a linen cloth and laid him in a tomb cut into the rock where nobody had ever lived. Pardon me, lain. Nobody lived in there either. It was the preparation day, and the Sabbath was about to begin. Now the women who had come with him out of Galilee followed, and they saw the tomb and how his body was laid. And then they returned and prepared spices and perfumes. And on the Sabbath, they rested according to the commandment. And you know what happened the next day? They went to the tomb, and guess what? He was gone. Brief prayer, please. Father, thank you again for this wonderful word. Guide and direct us now as we open it up. May we learn from it so that we can apply it for your kingdom's sake. Amen. I see the actions of three groups of people here. First of all, we have the soldiers. They're neutral. They've they got, no, they got no stake in this at all. They're soldiers. They're just doing their jobs. You know the story. they got nothing at stake. We also have the saints, the believers. These are the ones who have everything at stake. These are the ones that love Jesus. We'll talk about them in just a minute. We also see the enemies of Jesus, and we've watched them over these last few weeks. They hate him. they got everything at stake here too, and they have it at stake because they hate Jesus so much. And everything that these three groups do by his providence fit together to accomplish his purposes. The personalities of the people. Think about all the different personalities of these people. The free will that God gave us from the beginning. Wisdom that some have and some don't have as much. Power. Pilate had power. Herod had power. That had to be weaved into this. The motives that they had for doing things or saying things the motivations. I always talk to you about when we talk about the, the judgment seat of Christ. We're going to get rewarded on what we've done for Christ's sake, but also the motivation that we had for doing what we did for Christ's sake. So all this stuff plays into the providence of God and His will. These guys, these Jewish leaders, I have to get them in all the time, of course. These are the guys that crucified Jesus. These are the guys, we saw them as legalists, we saw them as hypocrites, we've seen them as blasphemers. They're the leaders. They're so concerned, you'll see later, they want his body down before 6 p.m. Why? Because Passover dinner starts at 6. And yet they had no problem crucifying him, the Son of God, in spite of the fact that seven times Pilate and Herod said, he's innocent. No problem doing that. But you better get him down off the cross. Passover is coming. Amazing. Amazing. Jesus was on the cross. They put him on at 9 a.m. He died at 3. Normally, two to three days to die from crucifixion. What do you do to get somebody to die quickly? Well, they knew. You break their legs. You break their legs. Why? What, what do the legs have to do with dying quicker? Very simple. When you're asphyxiating, and you're on the cross, you've got spikes through your feet, the only thing that's holding you up, no spikes, is your legs. Your legs. You break the legs, can't support you anymore, you'll be asphyxiated in minutes. In minutes. They went to break his legs. Amazing. John 19 says, He was dead already. They went to break his legs. He was dead already. What's the big deal here, Bruce? I don't know how many of you have ever heard of the swoon theory. Anybody heard about the swoon theory? Am I the only? No, I don't know. Mark knows. The swoon theory became two or three hundred years ago. And the swoon theory says Jesus never died on the cross. He just swooned 
semi-coma stuff. A lot of atheists still believe that. Hey, folks. The soldiers know when somebody's dead. That was their profession. They knew it. He was dead. Let's go over to John 19. I'm going to take just a minute here. John 19 is precious here. I'm going to read from 31 down to 37. Then the Jews, because it was a day of preparation so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, asked Pilate that their legs might be broken, that they may be taken away. So the soldiers came and they broke the legs of the first man and of the other was crucified with him. When they came to Jesus, when they saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear and immediately blood and water came out. And he who had seen had testified and his testimony is true. And he knows that he's telling the truth so you also may believe. For these things shall come to pass to fulfill the scripture. A bone of him shall, not a bone of him shall be broken. And again, another scripture says, they shall look on him whom they pierced. Now I've got four or five sermons on that passage there, but we won't go there today. Psalm 34, 20 says, Not a bone of him will be broken. Exodus 12, 46 says, The Passover lamb cannot have a broken bone. Verse 37 fulfills Zechariah 12, 10. Remember Zechariah 12, 10, talking about the end of the tribulation period. What does it say? Someday the Jews are going to look on him whom they have and we find out then that one third of the Jews then will receive Jesus as their Messiah. He's coming back with his church, one third of them, and they become the nation Israel that goes into the millennial reign of Christ. Folks, he's dead. He's dead. The prophecy is fulfilled. No matter what these other guys that, that do, the Jews, Pilate, soldiers, God's will is being done here. Regardless of what they've said or done. Amazing. Providence fulfills fulfill scripture. Fulfills scripture. And this validates the resurrection. Why? Because he died. And then we got a bunch of witnesses. And we've talked about that just about every Good Friday that I've been here. And, and Resurrection Sunday. Well, let's go back to Luke 23. <clears throat> Verse 50. And a man named Joseph, who was a member of the council, a good and righteous man, he had no, pardon me, he had not consented to their plan and action, a man from Arimathea, a city of the Jews, who was waiting for the kingdom of God. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. So we have the, na- the, the actions of the soldiers. Very neutral, doing their job. He's dead. Now we see the action of a, a believer, a believer who loves Jesus. And we see providence working through him. And we call his name Joseph of Arimathea. What do we know about Joseph? Not much. This is the only passage we see of Joseph of Arimathea. But we do know he's a member of the council. That's the Sanhedrin. Interesting, the Sanhedrin, they're made up of 70 of the elders. Well, weren't they the guys that put... But back in those mock trials, Bruce, wasn't the Sanhedrin had to give their stamp? Yep. Stamp of approval? Yep. Joseph was one of them. He has a lot, of, a lot at stake here, folks. What do we find out about him? He's good. He's righteous. And that word righteous, I looked it up, it's dikaios. D-I-K-A-I-O-S. Same word used for Jesus in verse 47. Righteous. Righteous. Now, Jesus was righteous by his nature. He never sinned, right? So Joseph got saved somewhere along the line. I don't know if he was saved before this or after this, but somewhere in the midst of all this, Joseph, just like the thief on the cross, he got saved through all, through all of this. Now, we've had righteous people in the New Testament. Go back to Luke chapter 1. Five years ago we started this, four and a half years ago. Remember Elizabeth? Remember her husband? Zacharias. We met a lady in the temple named Anna. Anna the prophetess in the temple. Righteous lady. Simeon. Simeon. Righteous man. John Baptist. Righteous man. So there are righteous people. 
not just Joseph of Arimathea and the thief. True believers, true believers. We call them the remnant. They're not the majority. There's a few of them. And all through history, God's always had his remnant. And I believe redemptive history, as you've gone through the scriptures, and you see time to time when there's, there's redemption, it moves through, the, through the, the remnant. It moves through the remnant believers. And even today, how many people call themselves Christian that aren't really, truly believers? Most of the scripture in the Old Testament, Israel was apostate. They were God's people, but they were apostate. You go to the judges, six different cycles. God needed to send a judge, straighten them out before they came back. And then they prospered. And then they left God. Over and over and over again. That's a great study. Pretty downer, though. Pretty much a downer. Israel was apostate, but there always, there's always been that remnant going through it. And this Joseph, he was a part of that. He was part of that. John tells us that Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but he was a secret disciple. Why? For fear of the Jews. But he was the real deal. He was a true believer. Why did he ask for the body? You ever ask that to yourself? Why did he bother asking for Jesus' body? I think he was a coward. Maybe he thought, maybe, and this is an opinion, maybe, maybe he thought it was the least he could do for his Messiah. He hadn't spoken up when he was in the Sanhedrin when they were, when they were putting him through those mock trials because he was afraid. Maybe he thought there would be some dignity in burying Jesus, dignity for Jesus in burying him. He's going to bury him in a tomb that nobody had ever been laid in. Dignity for Jesus' body. Why? Because every other crucified guy gets thrown into a pit outside town. Maybe that was part of it. I don't know. Mark 15, 43 says, He gathered up courage and went before Pilate. He was a coward, but he did it. He gathered up courage and went before Pilate. And he shows up right after the Jews asked Pilate to make sure his legs got broken. Of course, he doesn't know that at the time. Turn over to Mark 15, if you can. Mark 15. I love putting all the Gospels together to get the whole story, if you can. Verse 43 of Mark 15 says, Joseph of Arimathea came, a prominent member of the council, who himself was waiting for the kingdom of God. He was a believer. And he gathered up courage, and he went in before Pilate, and he asked for the body of Jesus. Pilate wondered if he was dead by this time, Jesus. And summoning the centurion, he questioned him as to whether he was already dead. And ascertaining this from the centurion, he granted the body to Joseph. And Joseph bought a linen cloth. He took him down. He wrapped him in the linen cloth. He laid him in a tomb which had been hewn out of the rock, and he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. What was really all, what, what was really behind all this? His love for Christ, maybe. He, 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 he felt a little guilty about having not done, doing what he should have done earlier, maybe. But I'm absolutely convinced this was all the purpose of God. Isaiah 53. You should have this worn out in your Bible. Isaiah 53, the crucifixion chapter. Verse 7 says this, and talking about the Messiah. He was oppressed, he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to slaughter, like a sheep that is silent before its shears, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and as for his generation, who considered that he would be cut off, killed, out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people to whom the stroke was due? And then verse 9 says this, His grave was assigned with wicked men, and yet he was with a rich man in his death. Why? He'd done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. It was planned that he be with the wicked. But what happened? He was 
buried with the rich. Joseph was rich. You didn't have a tomb if you weren't rich. And Joseph was motivated by his love, I think by his feeling of guilt. Hey, don't forget, he had to handle the body. A Jew's defiled. This is a bad thing. You do not handle dead bodies. And he did. He did. Providence of God was woven together through all of this stuff. And I find it fascinating because nothing, I couldn't find anything where anybody opposed Joseph doing this at all. Nobody argued with him. So what's the summary here? I wrote a summary out for myself. One man comes out of nowhere, Joseph. He's given permission by Pilate. Pilate sends the centurion just to check about the lakes. Centurion sends back. Pilate says, yeah, you can do it because he's dead. And you can have the body. You can have the body. And then verse 53 says, and he took it down and wrapped it in a linen, linen cloth. They didn't embalm the Jews. The Jews don't embalm like the Egyptians did at all. They, uh, they wrapped you and they sprinkled some powder on you. But then somebody else shows up. Go back to Go back to John. Sorry. This is what I do all day long. John 19. John 19, 38. But after these things, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but a secret one for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate granted permission. So he came and took away his body. Verse 39 says, Nicodemus who had first come to him by night also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 100 pounds weight, which is about between 65 and 75 pounds in our, in our measurements. Nicodemus shows up. Remember Nicodemus? Back to chapter 3, precious chapter of John. Nicodemus, Jesus, are you telling me I've got to be, be born again? Remember that? Do I come out of my mom's womb twice? Like, how does this work? The famous verse 16, verse 17 was said to Nicodemus. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And you know the rest of that. That was Nick. And he was a member of the Sanhedrin. He's made up his mind somewhere along the line. We couldn't find out in chapter 3 of John whether he got, was saved or not. But he's been saved. He's also a believer. And he's wrapped in linen, fit for a king. And he laid him in a tomb that nobody had lain in. Again, fit for a king. And when that happens, Isaiah 53 is fulfilled. This is prophesied. It's prophesied. I almost entitled this sermon today, What a, what a Funeral. <laughs> Why? No hymns sung. No pastors preaching. No prayers prayed, but I don't think there's any, any, any burial where more love was poured out by two guys than this one. Verse 54 of Luke 23, Sabbath was beginning. Preparation day, the Sabbath was about to begin. We meet some other people that love Jesus. All the way down to verse 56, we find out it's the women. Remember the women? They had followed him from Galilee. That's three years ago. Mary, Mary, Joanna, Susanna, and several others, I'm sure. They go, they see the tomb. What's the big deal, Bruce? It is a big deal. Why is it a big deal? Because many skeptics, even today, say those girls went to the wrong tomb. Atheists are great, eh? We don't like your theory. We'll make up our own theory. They went to the wrong tomb. But you know, Sunday morning, they took their spices to go to the tomb. They knew where he lay. And he was gone. The shock had hit them that morning. Folks, God is in control of everything for his purpose. When you think, think things are bad as we learned in Genesis with Jacob, Jacob this morning. Nothing else could go wrong here. 
We have the neutral soldiers. We have the saints that love Jesus. And finally, we have the leaders that hate him. The leaders that hate him. But guess what? God uses what they do for his purposes. Matthew 27. How you doing? Your fingers getting sore? Matthew 27. Verse 62. Now on the next day, the day after the preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered together with Pilate. They go to Pilate and said, Sir, we remember that he, when he was still alive, that deceiver, that blasphemer, that bum named Jesus said, After three days, <laughs> I'm going to rise again. <sighs> These guys are afraid the disciples are going to steal the body. Well, ain't that stupid? Yeah, steal his body? Why would they steal his body? Oh, he's going to, they're going to pretend he's alive. These guys aren't going to pretend he's alive. They're not going to go and give their lives. These guys are martyrs. They're going to be martyrs. They're not going to be martyrs for a lie. This is stupidity. And secondly, they didn't expect him to be risen again. Do you remember, remember when the girls came in and said, He's alive! He's alive! He's risen! And they said, That's nonsense! This is the disciples! Verse 65. I'll stop there. Pilate said, I better read 64. After three days, I'm going to... He says, after three days, I'm going to rise again. Therefore, give orders for the grave to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may come and steal him away and say to the people, he has risen from the dead. And the last deception will be worse than the first. Pilate says to them, you've got a guard. Go make it as secure as you want. They went and made the grave secure. And along with the guard, they set a seal on the stone. So the seal of Rome. Seal of Rome, you don't break. Seal of Rome, you don't break. This whole thing so stupid, though. They go and make the grave secure. They seal the grave. So, in fact, they're actually protecting the body that's in there. Nobody can get in. They're protecting that very body. That It's nuts. And so they're discrediting themselves. They're discrediting the, the lie that they spread by securing the grave. I'll end there. John says in, in verse uh, 31 of chapter 20, and all of this is written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ and believing you might have life in his name. And in the weeks to come, we're going to spend some time on in his name. How does God work? Directly, miracles. And by his providence that's constant. Because you know what, guys? His will be done. And if He's chosen you to do something and you don't do it, He'll choose somebody else. His will is going to be done. That plan is going to be exactly the same. It's going to look exactly the same when the history of this earth is over. Let's pray. Father, thank You. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for your word. Jesus, thank you for following through. Father, we, we so appreciate these gospels and your details that you give to us, that we can study them and learn by them and, and then be able to teach them and preach them and live by them. Oh, Father, thank you. And Father, we saw, we saw two guys today. Joseph, Nicodemus, who were high rankers in the leadership of the Jews. And we realize, Father, that you saved them. You saved them by your grace. And we thank you for that. Father, if there's anybody here or anybody watching today that are not saved or aren't sure if they're saved, May today be the day that they acknowledge the fact that they're sinners. That they repent of that sin. Turn around. Go the other way. Embrace Jesus as the only one who can save, save them. 
The other word for that is to believe in Him. Belief in the sense of obedience to Him. And ask for forgiveness. And He very clearly tells us that we'll go from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. May that be today for this group and the group watching. And all this is, is for eternity's sake. And we pray this for Christ's sake. Amen. Amen. Please stand once again.